Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach for health. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette. And I'm James O'Hara, nurse practitioner. And today we are talking about your health, your time, and your money, and where to invest it. So we've created a tier list. Uh, it's a very trendy thing, uh, whether you're talking about video games or other subjects. We've created the healthcare spending or health investment tier list. So what's up first on our list today? Yeah, so the different tiers, I guess, um, you have S tier, which stands for strong tier, and then you have A, B, C, D, and then uh, F as well. And then we have an extra one called R tier, that is the ripoff tier. So first on the list, we might as well go through strong tier. So as you would expect, you would have a proprietary blend of supplements to take here and pharmaceutical medications, right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, big pharma and big supplement, uh, definitely at the top of the list. No, yep. actually, we have an investment for you that is even better and will offer an even faster return than crypto. Investing in an HSA is like an instant 20 to 30 percent return on your money yep. because you don't pay taxes on that money. And you can use that money for pharmaceuticals and supplements or mm -hmm. any health procedure for the most part that you want to invest in. So you get more buying power just for putting that money in an HSA or FSA. You want to be careful with an FSA and make sure that you spend it because those are like use it or lose it. Whereas an HSA will follow you even if you change plans or leave a job, something like that. You get to keep that money. Yeah, an HSA is a no brainer. Um, yes, it can be difficult to choose one and set one up. But then after that, it's like you're getting uh, bonus points from not having to pay extra tax on that money. And um, a lot of plans, you can take them out for certain reasons, for example, retirement or whatnot. But um, that being said, we do like paying our taxes because they do go to some good causes. And if you guys want to pay extra tax, you can still get an HSA and you can still just donate extra tax money if you desire. There is actually a mechanism to where you can do that. Or of course, you can take this money and give it to a nonprofit or um, an organization that's a benefit corp um, as well. So um, wait, so is paying extra taxes tax deductible? I doubt it. I <laughs> highly doubt it. Yeah. Um, anyway, but, this is this is not supposed to be about tax. That's just the first thing on our S tier. And the next two are our first two pillars of health. So diet and exercise and we talk about these frequently on this and other podcasts mm -hmm. and really this is another no-brainer as far as a place to invest your dollars and time and health so if you're looking at the most bang for your buck exercise wise we'll start there because people like to hear about exercise yep. more than diet so we'll give the viewers what they want um, where would you be spending your time if you had let's say three hours per week to exercise? If I had three hours per week, I would spend 90 to 120 minutes. So an hour and a half to two hours with resistance training, perhaps incorporate one of those days as high intensity interval training. Um, and then somehow I would just make time to also do 90 more minutes of zone two cardio. <laughs> so that adds up to what, uh, four, four hours. Um, but I would split it about half and half between resistance training and cardio and doing uh, a, you know, an intense interval training, uh, even if it's CrossFit style, CrossFit's not cool anymore, so you can't say CrossFit, but a CrossFit style workout um, per time invested, it gives you a pretty high return on investment. You just don't want to do that vigorous interval training more than two times a week. Yeah, I think that's similar to what I would do. I would pick um, probably two days. I would have one day where I'm doing full body resistance training, mm -hmm. short rest periods between so I can hit everything. Another day where I'm doing a not CrossFit, but high intensity style training, also full body. And then I would probably do some high intensity interval for my cardio and split that up into another two days. So probably training 30 minutes to high intensity interval training sessions, um, not specifically whole body resistance training, but something like intervals on a bike, uh, maybe some sprinting, depending on the health of your connective tissue and how used to running you are. 
because you certainly don't want to injure yourself, which you know you do have a higher risk of injury when you're doing high intensity. But for time efficiency, it's hard to beat. Yeah, that's a good summary of exercise and um, a lot of the pillars of health. And by the way, you can't say pillar without pill. <laughs> pill, is, <laughs> pill is in pillars, but I guess the more pillars of health you do, the less pills you will need, especially in the long term. Diet's the next one and pretty much anything that you can get via supplementation, you can also get from diet. It can just be more difficult. The main thing here to concentrate on is protein quantity and quality. And um, in addition to that, especially depending on how much you're exercising, things like electrolytes, micronutrients, vitamins. But I don't have time to exercise and isn't eating healthy expensive? It, it can be expensive, but you don't have to go to Whole Foods, like my wife, like shop Whole Foods. <laughs> uh, shout out to her um, to eat high quality food. Uh, we priced a few items at Walmart and these are definitely good investments in your health. One of my favorites is a huge bag of potatoes. Uh, you can get 10 pounds for about $7.17. And yes, despite their oxalate content, they are healthy. I like eating them with fish. Um, but there's a lot of different things that are actually quite affordable and quite healthy. Yeah, you can actually get uh, canned sardines for about a dollar per can. You get your even the my plate recommendations are about eight ounces per week. So that's two and a half dollars a week to get your recommended seafood in. And the average person gets basically zero servings of seafood per week, which is a great nutrient dense food, great yep. source of omega threes. Um, and to my surprise, it's actually cheaper serving per serving to eat black canned beans than it is to eat pop tarts. Pop tarts are actually slightly more expensive than beans. So. When people say that eating healthy is expensive, there's a lot of examples where that is false. Um, and then the argument becomes, well, it, it doesn't taste as good. And that is absolutely valid. <laughs> yeah, a can of beans not is palatable. not going to taste as good as a yeah. Pop-Tart. Sauces are your friend. I guess that could be one TikTok trend that's actually helping is the mustard diet. If you find a mustard that you like, for example, uh, a ground up mustard and salt, and that's the only ingredients. Uh, it can be essentially no calories, and you can put a lot of that on your food, hot sauces. I love my fermented chilies. Uh, we just started fermenting our Tabasco peppers from this year for homemade fermented Tabasco sauce. Things like that um, might not be super cheap. Sauces do add up, but they do make uh, a whole food, less palatable diet, much more palatable. Yeah, and we, it, putting protein sources aside, we did a rough estimate of what it would take to get three servings of fruits, three servings of vegetables, a serving of nuts, and two servings of seafood in per week. Mm -hmm. And it came out to about $70 a month, which is cheaper than your favorite powdered green supplement. So I, I found that kind of interesting. Yeah, um, it's not cheaper than a multivitamin, though. It is not. Multivitamins are dirt cheap, and it's really surprising to me to see opposition when the average person goes into the doctor and they say, oh, well, you know, my doc said, uh, wasting my money, I don't need to take a multivitamin. Well, how much money are those people really wasting on a once a day multivitamin? Maybe a, a decent amount if it's a Gucci brand. <laughs> <laughs> not, not everybody needs a, um, you know, a custom multivitamin that's AM, PM, um, you know, if you've had bariatric surgery or if you have malabsorption or if you have, let's say you, you're a compound mutant homozygote for MTHFR, you probably need to make sure you have methylated B vitamins and folate. But not everybody needs a fancy multivitamin. Um, you're mentioning that capsules in general could have better absorption. And then uh, chelate multivitamins, uh, for example, if some of your um, vitamins are, and uh, some of your nutrients in the multivitamin are in different forms. They can have different bioavailabilities, but for the average individual, um, even an over-the-counter multivitamin, you'll absorb some of those nutrients and it is a very low cost. So for your tier list of the investment portion of it, it's a high yield investment considering it's very low cost. Yeah. And if we're looking in terms of population averages where 80% of people don't eat three servings of fruit, 90% of people don't eat three servings of vegetables. 
then I think for that 80, 85% of the population, then a multivitamin probably does make sense. So we don't recommend a multivitamin for every single patient that comes to our practice. It really depends on what the baseline diet is and then what changes they're willing to make. Some people, they're never ever going to take or never ever going to eat vegetables. They, mm -hmm. they just won't do it. Um, and that's okay. You can build around what someone's preferences and, and values are. And, and that's where individualized medicine comes in. Yeah. Our last strong tier recommendation is kind of a tie in between the sunlight pillar of health and the sleep pillar of health. Yeah. And this is a low cost, low time intervention. It's a mask that you should be wearing only when sleeping. So there's a lot of pro mask and anti mask people out there. And I really don't understand it, but one time you should definitely be wearing a mask is while you're sleeping and specifically a sleeping mask, not an N95, not a surgical mask, but a sleeping mask while sleeping. Yep. Over yeah. what part of your body? Over the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, that sums up our S tier, our strong tier of um, health spending dollars, I suppose. The only caveat to that, if there's any companies or individuals with companies that are considering sponsoring our, sponsoring our podcast, that product is also in the strong tier <laughs> of recommendations. Uh, uh, that's funny. Uh, a joke, of course, but... Um, it does seem like there are a lot of uh, podcasts that act like a certain supplement is the foundation of health. And I, I think we've done a good job of being balanced and, you know, putting lifestyle interventions, supplementation when appropriate, medications when appropriate is sort of our you know, foundation. But the pillars of health are, are really something that we do live by. Yeah, certainly. So, and, and again... Uh, supplements and medications are basically the same. They just have an effect on the body that's called pharmacodynamics and everybody um, individually and uniquely metabolizes them. That's pharmacokinetics. And they're just tools to help the lifestyle interventions work. So just like somebody's not gonna dig out of a pit of quicksand if you throw a shovel at them, at the same time, a shovel can be very useful. So that's how we see that. I think we can- Sometimes you get hit by the shovel and that's, that's a side effect. Yeah, that is definitely a side <laughs> effect. And if you don't use it, it can also cause you to sink down even more. So um, with that, moving on to the A tier, um, these are still really good interventions. They're perhaps not as OP, they're not as overpowered, but um, whenever you go to, and I think we talked about this in our Dysfunctional Medicine podcast, please mm -hmm. check that out if you have not listened. Um, but functional medicine, according to us, is root cause medicine. So uh, a cookie cutter program where you get $3,000 worth of labs when you first go to the service. And regardless of symptoms, you're getting urinary and salivary hormones tested and you're getting um, gut microbiome. Well, not gut microbiome. You're getting what's excreted from the gut microbiome tests and you're getting heavy metal tests and you're getting hair analyses and you're getting um, uh, tick bite analyses, even though you don't live in a region or you have no history of tick, like these cookie cutter programs are not great investments in your health. So it's okay to get lots of information and to want to dig deeper. But one of the best things that we see as an alternative to that is getting a complete nutrient and vitamin panel, both in the serum and intracellularly. Yeah. And that circles back to your, one of the first two pillars, the diet. So what are you eating in your diet and what are you absorbing and what are you incorporating into cells? I um, think that's really reasonable and we could probably even put a basic blood work or what we consider to be a basic yeah. blood work panel. So generally this is sub $200 versus a $3,000 panel. It kind of reminds me of investing. Like when you mentioned all the, the fancy like oh, salivary testing, urinary testing, gut testing. Um, it's like when you someone gets into day trading, right? And they've got to yeah. have a ton of indicators, and spreadsheets, and they're tracking all this stuff. When really they're better off just putting money in an index fund if you look at averages. Mm -hmm. So just because it's more complicated doesn't necessarily make it more valuable or better. Yeah, that's a good summary. Um, on that note, we have not mentioned all the pillars of health. Um, all the other pillars of health, including social health, um, interaction with family, if one of your family members is struggling with health, then that can certainly throw things off. I guess also in this tier, we could mention anything to do with the health of a pediatric patient. So you're just literally gonna have better return on investment if you catch something early during childhood. For example, a, um, a percolating metabolic syndrome. If there is somebody that 
um, obviously or not obviously has metabolic syndrome at age 11. If you catch that before puberty and preventive precocious puberty and a whole sequela of events after that, that's mm -hmm. a really good return on investment. Yeah, again, goes back to investing as a literal process that start early, it's always gonna be better. Mm -hmm. And our other pillars of health, um, you know, we mentioned sleep briefly, sleeping mask, and sleep is actually a pretty steep time investment. You know, seven, eight hours per night for adults, you need even more if you're a child or adolescent. So it is a big time commitment, um, but it's something that we do need and we should prioritize. And uh, if we look at how most people uh, spend their day, like, we talked about three hours of exercise per week. Mm -hmm. Averages, people watch about three hours of television per day. So when people make the argument that I don't have time, there are some people who literally don't have time because they are busy from the time they get up to the time they go to bed, but that's a small minority of the population. So sleep, I can't stress it enough, um, you know, avoiding electronics, definitely not having a TV in the bedroom. There has been an abundance of research on this and having a TV in your bedroom, um, it doesn't directly make you more likely to develop diabetes and obesity, but people with TVs in their bedroom are at a higher risk of diabetes mm -hmm. and obesity uh, because they're absorbing calories from the food commercials, right? <laughs> I guess so. Um, a lot of reasons to do that. I like the 10, 3, 2, 1, 0 rule, 10 hours before sleep, no caffeine, three hours and two hours, no vigorous exercise and no large meals, one hour, no bright blue or bright white light, and then zero snooze in the morning and also attempt zero or minimal fluctuation the time that you go to bed and wake up, but especially the time you go to bed. Um, and then I guess also wait 30 minutes before consumption of caffeine in the morning. So those lifestyle interventions are going to be much better than any sleeping pill. Um, I, I think we briefly talked about stress in relation to family and social health, but with stress, you want to make your stress feel good. Uh, there's not really such a thing as a life devoid of stressors, just being an organic machine with a finite timeline. There's a lot of physical and metaphysical and mental stress that goes along with that and that ties in with the spirit pillar of health. But learning how to make that stress feel good, just like you can kind of learn and teach yourself the habit of making the pain of lifting a weight feel good, um, that can be done with life in general as well. Yeah, you definitely don't want a zero stress life. If, if someone has zero stress from, you know, say, the age of 10 onward, they're not going to build up uh, resilience. And you do want mm -hmm. to be able to handle stress and be resilient and choosing stressors that will foster that. And there's overlap in my mind between stress in our next pillar of health, sunlight, um, because we need to be spending more time outside, of course, you know, protected from sunlight because too much of a, a good thing can be bad. Mm -hmm. But from a mental health standpoint, especially um, things like traffic noise, um, background noise in cities, those are associated with you know, worse mental health. You can literally put people, put headphones on them and play traffic noises and their blood pressure goes up. Um, it's a stressor, not a positive stressor. Taking a nature walk is going to increase parasympathetic activity. And take those same people, put headphones on them, play bird song, they're gonna have a, an increase in parasympathetic nervous activity. We kind of need the reassurance that we're in a safe environment as opposed to being surrounded by you know, constant threats. And you could argue we're all a little bit um, wired to be in fight or flight. And we'll talk about you know, why um, things that can help you adapt to that might be beneficial in an, another tier. But I think we're all under a bit more stress and taking some time to unwind and you know, taking a nature walk, you know, even if it's just five minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the morning, that's going to be a really positive thing as far as your stress um, will help with sleep as well. It, they all kind of overlap with one another. So for that reason, I think you know, spending time outdoors is something that we don't do enough of and we should do more of. And that's why it's one of our pillars of health. Yeah, I love living in the country. I love helping take care of the gardens and the animals and whatnot. And things like thousand hours outside is a, is a good thing to attempt to do as a family. So, and again, that ties in with social health and spiritual health. Um, we've talked about these in many other podcasts, so perhaps we'll move on a bit. Um, but we should mention uh, when it comes to spiritual health, even if you're completely a religious, a spiritual or whatnot, 
at the end of the day, uh, it helps to know what your medical phys- metaphysical meaning is, even if it's uh, just being a nihilist. So, yeah, and that's the the one thing that we can't really tell someone exactly what to do. You know, as far as these other pillars, we can really give people like intervention, say, hey, do this, do this. And then people are like, well, what do I do about spiritual health? And that's really a journey that each person has to go through themselves, the journey that um, I'm still going through myself. I think, you know, we all are continuing to grow spiritually, whether we know it or not. Yeah. If someone seems that they're not um, at least thinking about their metaphysical health, uh, perhaps they're ignoring it and that can be detrimental. Then when your physical health declines, all of a sudden you're in a metaphysical crisis at the same time, trying to figure out if you lived a good life or not. So being, um, you know, thinking about that is a, uh, a tier, uh, especially because you can do things like that as you're outside, as you're doing your zone two cardio, you can stack these things. It's not like you have to sit in the library, like a philosopher or like, um, the Greek philosopher that just sat on a pillar for, for two weeks, defecating on top of it, <laughs> um, Dionysius or whatever his name was, but Um, Um, Talking about uh, tax dollars going to good purposes, how about seatbelts? Seatbelts have saved a lot of lives. They've saved a lot of people from not necessarily dying, but if they are in a car accident, they're going to be substantially less likely to be disabled, which is good for their health. So um, we can argue about taxes and say that, you know, for all the tax dollars we're putting in, public health is getting worse, but... Seatbelts are the silver lining. Um, these have done good. And then we also have helmets here. So yep. uh, don't leave home without it. Wear a seatbelt, wear a helmet, wear both of them, specifically the helmet if you're on a motorcycle or bicycle, and the seatbelts if you are a passenger or driving a car. Yep. Um, and also specifically on like a bicycle or a skateboard if you're going more than maybe five miles per hour. Um, or if you're in a dangerous location or if you're going to get hit by something. So um, be smart about it. Um, there's a lot of applications for seat belts and, hel- and helmets. The last thing in our A tier is therapy with the caveat uh, if therapy is indicated, if there is a uh, psychological or mental issue to be worked on. Yeah, if there is a true mental health issue that has a psychological root, then therapy is a great investment there. Yep. CBT, like we've discussed before, nope. is always the right answer. Nope. Um, you know, more stress, it's not gonna make any health condition better. Um, more coping skills is gonna be beneficial for just about any situation. Mm-hmm. The next tier is the B tier. So not quite, quite as high yield as an A tier and definitely not overpowered. But um, there's two main things on this. Uh, Medications, I guess that's technically the first pill that has been on our tier list. So when indicated, medications can be very helpful. There's lots of them that certainly prolong both quality and quantity of life. And this could include anything from a prescribed peptide to a diabetes medication to a blood pressure medication to a lipid medication, to testosterone replacement. There's a lot of things that are on this. All under the umbrella of medications. It's just when it's indicated though. So different people require different tools. If we're looking at B tier, maybe we should also add the caveat that the medication is indicated and affordable. Because Hmm. if it's a medication that's unaffordable, then it's not particularly a great investment for that person. So. to the powers that PCSK make nines. medications unaffordable out there, specifically over $500 per month, that is not a B tier move. Yep. That would be an R tier ripoff. <laughs> <laughs> I think that fits perfectly yeah. in the R tier. Um, and then we also have under B tier um, adaptogens. So this would be a, a certain class of supplements that could be useful in stressful situations that we all experience day to day. Um, I, you could even call something like coffee an adaptogen because yeah. it helps you to adapt to whatever challenge you're facing in your day to day. Some people, life is just better when you're on coffee and coffee has some health benefits that have you know, been established in the literature. Personally, it's part of my morning routine. Kyle's taking a drink of coffee right now. 
So we are proponents of coffee. We're owned by Big Coffee, uh, unashamedly. Yeah. So if there's any coffee company out there that wants to sponsor the <laughs> podcast, that would be wonderful. Let's talk. Um, the next tier is C tier. And um, first, we can talk about eating organic food. We've already mentioned um, various foods. Um, this could potentially be higher if it's your own organic food that you grow. Um, our garden is absolutely booming this year. We had a huge, we've had a huge spread of things that were basically eating as fast as possible, and they're extremely tasty and organic. Um, so it it could be a bit better. The reason why it's lower is because it just tends to be more expensive, and it's actually pretty hard to qualify something as organic if. Um, my family and I harvested a whole bunch more from our garden and we do have enough to where we're giving it to friends and family and we took it to the farmer's market to sell it. We could not market it as organic. Yeah. And it is complicated when you talk about organic because you can, you can put someone in a corner and say, well, would you rather have more or less glyphosate on your food? And well, the answer is like, well, yeah, yeah, less. Like I don't yep. want to be intentionally drinking Roundup, but at the same time, there's not a plethora of literature either that would compare organic to inorganic foods. Yep. So let's say you're eating some blueberries that had pesticides put on them at some point versus organic blueberries that did not. You're probably not going to be able to detect an effect size in a short period of time. So 12 weeks of blue either blueberries being added to the diet, those people are probably going to get healthier. So Getting hung up on that is a, sort of a barrier to health for some people and not something that we should overthink, even though it does get kind of sensationalized in the health social media spaces. Yeah. And I suppose you could say, let's say you've already invested your money in everything in, an ab in the tiers above this, then it is reasonable to do. That's not in a F tier or an R tier. Uh, and my family mostly does eat organic. Um, but we've already invested in the other tiers of our health as well. And um, there's obviously a difference in something that's organic where the comparable product is um, something that tends to not get a whole lot of pesticide on it versus something that does. And yes, the dirty dozen is not perfect, but it's a decent rule of thumb. Um, I think that's a, a good synopsis of eating organic food. Um, make wise decisions, but keep in mind that it it's not necessary for everyone to have a long health span. You can eat things that are not, are not organic as well. Yep. And then next we have a, a GI map. So this is stool testing. You might be surprised to see this in C tier. And this is a tricky one because the optimal gut microbiome has not really been yep. characterized, but we do know that there are things that are associated with good gut health, things that are associated with poor gut health, mm -hmm. uh, as well as systemic health. And probably the majority of the population is going to be um, low or, or maybe completely undetectable in terms of things like acromancia because they're not getting fiber in and not feeding a healthy gut microbiome. Yeah. So this can be a way to really steer someone's diet to target what they are missing in. Um, but it's certainly not in our you know, top tier. Uh, but there can be yeah. a number of advantages to, to stool testing. Yep. Um, choosing whether you're going to eat carbohydrates or fats off of stool testing, probably not particularly good. I know there are a number of companies that'll look at this and they'll say, oh, there's a lot of fat in your stool, so eat less fat or you know, things of that nature. There's a ton of these spin up companies. I can't quite keep up with what their claims are. But yeah. uh, the GI map is something that's been around for quite a long time. Um, and I think has been validated, you know, has had some data published. Mm -hmm. So um, for that reason, we think that is a, you know, if you're going to get some gut testing, make sure that it has some scientific validation, you have some publications, that sort of thing. Yeah, we actually order a pretty high amount of um, gut microbiome and stool tests. Some of them also have a fit test, which is a colon cancer screening test for one year. So that's a nice little inclusion if uh, you're not able to or you're holding off on getting endoscopy or a Cologuard. Um, and there's a lot of other companies other than Diagnostic Solutions, GI Map, we just kind of use it um, interchangeably, just like you say, Kleenex is a tissue. Um, so yeah, I guess some people would probably expect us to put this in a higher tier, but uh, part of the reason why it's so low is it's a relatively high cost 
Uh, usually I think it's something almost like almost $400 for a test, which is um, pretty significant because you can get uh, basically every nutrient and vitamin in your entire body, including CoQ10, including your omegas, intracellular and serum for about the same cost incurred. So if, for someone who doesn't have gut pathology, that's a way better uh, investment. And a lot of clinics and a lot of places make you get a GI map or a similar test, regardless, even if you have had perfect gut health your entire life and no other reason to get one. So, yeah. And if a patient tells me, it's like, oh, I uh, eat Pop-Tarts every day for breakfast. I order DoorDash. And the only time I leave my house is to go through a McDonald's drive through I don't need a GI map to tell me that their gut health is going to be off. Um, so, I mean, you can get a lot from looking at the pillars of health before you move down the chain and look at a bunch of extensive testing, which is why we emphasize, like you said, the micronutrient panel, which is the endpoint that we care about in terms of what your gut is absorbing or not absorbing. Yep. The next tier is D tier, and perhaps we can run through these a bit faster unless they need nuance described. Uh, the first one that we can talk about is urine and salivary hormone testing. So uh, especially if you get at home urine and salivary hormone testing as the only testing without blood testing in order to see if you need hormone replacement or hormone balancing or not. Um, there's of course some exceptions to this. There's really good candidates that benefit a ton, especially people looking at cortisol and whatnot, but um, there are certainly places that you can go for healthcare advice that this is the only test you get and they tell you items secondary to it, which are often just wrong. For example, if you have a high SHBG, then androgens and estrogens are gonna look lower. If you have a high CBG, then urinary and salivary um, glucocorticoids like cortisol, cortisone, and progestogens are going to look lower. Um, it, it's a solid D tier test. Yeah, especially if you're looking at like urinary neurotransmitters, um, hydration and how people eliminate different mm -hmm. hormones and drugs. There's a lot of genetic variability there, which I don't think is accounted for. Nope. Um, and I do like the cortisol salivary test. It's probably my favorite peripheral hormone test. Yep. I guess if that's the umbrella we put it under. Um, and then if you're looking at another example in the dried urine testing, you can get the ratio of the different metabolites of estrogen being metabolized yeah. can be useful because there are some associations there with a more favorable metabolism pathway, less favorable that's been associated, not proven as causal, but associated with better or worse outcomes as it relates to breast cancer. So for women, uh, postmenopausal women especially, that can make sense to check. Um, but unfortunately, it does come with a conglomerate of other tests that aren't particularly useful. I think that's a good summary. We mentioned genetics. Um, a lot of basic genetic tests, especially the retail direct consumer, check these 12 single nucleotide polymorphisms, and it's going to tell you everything to do, uh, how to change your diet, how to change your lifestyle. Um, it's going to unlock the code to your genome by just testing, a SNP, by the way, is a single nucleotide polymorphism. It's like testing one letter of one word, of one sentence, of one paragraph, of one chapter, of one book, <laughs> of the entire encyclopedia, except even on a much larger scale for your genome. And yes, um, some SNPs are definitely helpful, but not for every single individual. For example, if you're someone starting an HRT, and you're at risk of venous thromboembolism, it might make a lot of sense to check your prothrombin gene, your factor five, your factor two, your factor eight in some cases, your protein C, your protein S. But for most people, especially just a, literally just a SNP, um, it is not a good return on investment. You're often paying hundreds of dollars for information that tells you nothing that is clinically significant. And that is the important point is that the test results are only as valuable as the interpretation. And I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again because it's extremely frustrating when a genetic testing company puts someone in the 99th percentile for developing a blood clot when they don't have a factor V or a prothrombin <laughs> mutation, the two yeah. strongest known genetic associations. So keep that in mind. Um, take those with a grain of salt. Make sure you're talking to a a uh, provider that is knowledgeable in this area or even a genetic counselor if you are getting genetic testing done. 
Yep. Um, and, and that could apply even to the, the blood testing, um, making sure that it's interpreted appropriately because that's where the real value is going to be. Yeah, I would throw in age clocks, um, regardless of the age or epigenetic clock, biologic age clocks. I would put all of them in this, in this category as well. Um, they basically just tell you how healthy you've been the last day or two because those numbers can change so quickly. Um, we'll, we'll have much more on that later, but uh, yeah. it's also D tier, I maybe saw, even R tier. Yeah, I saw recently um, someone tested three different epigenetic age clocks. Uh, they were not taking rapamycin, got all three tests done, started taking rapamycin, did all three tests again, and almost too perfectly, one test showed that they got younger or healthier. One test showed they stayed the same age and the other test showed that their aging was accelerated. So take from that what you will. I thought it was pretty comical. And there's also some research that's been done in cancer uh, treatment, chemotherapy, where it accelerates age clocks and then the age clocks slow down. But if you are undergoing active cancer treatment, you don't want to stop your chemo just because your age clock is going to go down. Um, so they don't have a lot of clinical validity yeah. at this point in time. The next one would be one single day where you get an executive physical, an executive physical day. So yeah. what was the pitch for this? We saw a website when we were reviewing uh, basically you know, what's offered and, and kind of what the leading clinics are doing. It was like yeah. devote an entire day to your health, which is what about 0.3% of the year. So that's the amount of time you devote to health. And then you don't worry about it the rest of the year, right? Yeah. It's like, uh, let's say you have a car. Because at the end of the day, again, we're just organic machines. You go to an expert mechanic who is also a pit crew chief for Formula One. This is a, a true expert in cars, both the structure and function and optimizing performance, not just preventing it from breaking down. And you hook it up to their computers and their machines, and it gives you a, a text report read-off. And you get a summary of perhaps a couple recommendations just that day. And then you're supposed to take the, in, the next several decades of having the car and I guess interpreting that yourself. Obviously the benefit would be if you paid to have that pit crew chief or that mechanic give you advice on your car longitudinally, you can send them messages whenever and um, you are, you know, they are your employee and they take care of your car rather Health than consultant. Yeah. yeah, rather than just one day. Um, it's a moving target and things obviously change, problems arise, and uh, you don't want to have to uh, go back one day, you know, four or five different times a year. <laughs> and some years there might be dozens of problems arise. Um, and perhaps if you had been having that mechanic longitudinally the year before, they could have prevented those from happening. Yeah. The mental picture I'm getting, you know, talking about Formula One and performance is you have a car, you want to get more horsepower out of it, and you're just slapping a tune on and putting it on the dyno once a year. Yep. Um, it's like, okay, we've got the tune. Do you want us to run it again? Nope. Um, only do that once a year. So you're not going to get a lot of value out of that. Yeah. And a lot of these physical programs were... You know, you have to do every single piece of imaging. I've seen a lot of them. We don't need to name them, but there is a ton of these startups. They could cost 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. And ev yes, everybody gets their SNP testing, D tier. Everybody gets their gut microbiome, C tier. Everybody gets their salivary urinary hormone testing, D tier. Everybody gets their uh, CCTA. Okay, that might be reasonable unless you're well under the age of 30 with no other risk factors. And that is a tiny fraction of the $20,000 price tag yeah. on some of these. So you add up all these and they add up to, and by the way, all those things that these executive physical programs, and yes, we are launching our own program, which is not just one day, but longitudinally, more information on that later, all of them add up to maybe what, 4,000 4, total? A fraction of the cost. Yeah, so you're like, well, like that. where did all that other, where'd the other amounts of money Follow go? The money. And they don't even have to message you back and forth for an entire year thinking about your case, combing over history, taking all the things into account. Um, it is just, yeah, the executive physical days, really, we should probably put them in F tier. Um, the big caveat is a lot of them do um, calcium scores or clearly CCTAs, Pernuvos, things like that, which, um, do 
help catch things early on. So if you have a lot of disposable income and you aren't really worried about people ripping you off and you get some degree of health information, then I suppose it's reasonable. Those are just better programs to spend it in. Yeah, I think I saw recently it was the, the uh, uh, American College of Radiology, something like that. They put out a statement saying that they do not endorse or there's no evidence to support full body MRI scanning. Talked about health anxiety and incidental findings. And if people are counseled appropriately on that, then you're really deciding who's a good candidate and who's not. If you have someone that thinks that they are developing cancer or thinks that they're having a heart attack every time something abnormal happens in their body, one ache or pain, probably not a great candidate to go and get a full body MRI, a lot of invasive testing. If you have someone who is in tune with their body and wants to be 10 out of 10 preventive, you know, some people do want to be very yep. proactive and aggressive with health prevention. And that's not a problem. They're not, it's not a character, character flaw to care about your health. Then it could be very reasonable. Yeah, it's frustrating when individuals have gotten several of these, what we call direct to consumer tests, whether they're genetic tests, whether they're full body MRIs, none of these have been ordered by a physician. They probably have a bunch of labs as well. Um, maybe even labs that check for cancer genes, not ordered or um, indirectly ordered by a physician. I don't know what the phrasing on that is, but they think they're very high risk of cancer and they think they have all these issues. And um, it's they're really kind of at a point in their health journey where they are so far behind because they already have the sick role. And again, I know we talk about this all the time, but they already see themselves as sick and something is wrong and they'll never be healthy. And perhaps they're even on disability. And um, instead, before they start getting all these different tests and trying to be their own doctor, they should have just sought out high quality medical advice. And then they would have still found all the same things, but within a different context. So, And this is where we could circle back to tier A, talk about therapy when it's indicated. If someone has a sick identity, you can find ways to still associate yourself with health and identify as being healthy, even if you have a medical condition. But there's plenty of people out there that have high blood pressure, but it's managed and they are still a healthy person. So just because you take a prescription medication doesn't mean you are unhealthy. Mm -hmm. There's sort of this obsession with being medication free in certain influencer spaces and the social media health circles, but it's not really warranted because someone can use a medication to improve their health. Yep. Just like you can use a supplement or a vitamin to improve your health. Yeah, I always like to say my wife uh, lovingly calls me the world's biggest hypochondriac. <laughs> and I still see myself as healthy. And yes, sometimes whenever I get my labs back, um, more so years ago compared to now, um, I would feel terrible when I got them back. And same thing for imaging studies too. Um, and I often do take about 10 different pills a day, half of them medications, half of them supplements. So for a lot of people, that would be difficult to do that and get the amount of blood test and whatever other indicated tests that I do for my health history, but um, I still am able to see myself as someone who is healthy. Yeah. And you probably didn't start all 10 of those things at the same exact time. It's been a health journey as, as it's been in my case. Yep. The next one is blue blocker. So I believe this is our last D tier item. Um, blue blockers, potentially helpful, maybe the last hour of the day but most people wear them the rest of the day and that can actually be uh, detrimental to yeah. health. can decrease your color sensitivity for blues and greens, I believe. When these first came out and people were wearing them all day and all night, a lot of people really screwed up their vision. Now it does appear to be transient, which is good, but if you're gonna use blue blockers, probably only makes sense to use them for a couple of hours before bed. Um, red light therapy also has some Weak data out there supporting you know, use a couple hours before bed might be helpful for sleep. But again, not where we're telling people, put your health dollars here. Yeah. Next tier is F tier. And so, this is where the fun begins. Yeah, this is fun failing. And we've actually talked about a lot of these before. Heavy metal tests for every individual. And yes, we do have um, patients with various types of heavy metal poisoning. Um, but... You know, if you go into a clinic 
And we don't really ever call ourselves a functional medicine clinic. And again, see our dysfunctional medicine podcast for more info on this. But we know at a lot of clinics, you go in and if you have any symptom, fatigue, brain fog, whatever it is, regardless of your exposure, you get heavy metal tests, you get mold tests, and you get an extensive tick-borne panel. And these are often very expensive too. So between the three of these, it could be $2,000 and the clinic probably charges you $3,000 or $4,000. Um, and there's a high rate of false positives and difficulty interpreting the test. So we don't need to go into the specifics of that, but um, it is very common to see these tests m misinterpreted. So um, we'll leave it at that for those yeah. F-tier tests. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose we, we can leave it there. Maybe watch for more dysfunctional medicine content in the future. Um, and another F-tier intervention would be therapy when the problem is not psychological, but the problem is physiologic. Yep. So a couple of examples here. The first one I'm making up, um, let's say <coughs> someone has a um, thyroiditis. They're in a thyroid storm. Yep. Uh, oh, you have anxiety. Go to therapy. Yep. How useful is that going to be for that person? Not particularly not uh, a real example that I've heard from multiple men, uh, men with erectile dysfunction, is that they go to a urologist, they're young, metabolically healthy, urologist says, you know, this is all in your head, go see a therapist. And I think that's a huge disservice to those patients. Another example that we've talked about before is women with um, anovulatory cycles or amenorrhea, for example, hypothalamic amenorrhea. Um, mostly a physiologic problem. Yes, obviously, when you're in that situation, I think anybody in a situation where they're concerned for fertility and their bone mass and their health in general um, is going to have secondary uh, psychological troubles. But to cure that, recommending just therapy does not make a lot of sense. Yeah, I agree there. And you know, th like I said earlier, stress is not going to improve any health condition, more psychological stress is not always better. Mm. And therapy, like, yeah, it can be useful. Um, CBT is always the right answer. If you're taking a multiple choice test and you're looking for one answer that is always right, mm -hmm. it's CBT. Um, and that brings us to our R, R tier. So R for ripoff. So we mentioned one of these earlier, the epigenetic or biologic age clocks. Um, I think a health score would be more appropriate yep. uh, because it doesn't really tell you your age. But if people can see where their health score is on a scale of 0 to 100, I think that would be a far more valuable tool to build on your health journey. Yeah, stay tuned for more info on our health score. I know that we've talked about this before with Dr. Taylor Martin, uh, board-certified preventive medicine physician from Johns Hopkins and uh, master's of public health data scientist as well. Um, but a uh, thousand foot view on this is a lot of times they use that to sell you another product and they're um, kind of using the biologic or age clock as um, a special sauce to justify marking up something to a margin of several hundred percent. So watch out for those. And again, just because somebody has one of these included in their service, some people are just curious and they wanna know. Some patients wanna know their DNA pheno age and um, our staff will occasionally help them calculate that. That way they, you know, sometimes you're just curious, I wonder what this would come back yeah, as. The novelty of it yeah. may not be particularly useful, but uh, it's interesting. Yeah, if it comes back particularly bad, then if anything, maybe it's a bit of a reality check of how your lifestyle has been lately, or just to talk to a doctor again, if you're not. But there's not a whole lot of use to this. The other R tier item we've actually spoken about earlier, it's taxes. Avoid at all costs. Yep. Well, avoid as you are <laughs> as as you are able to and not obligated to. Yeah. So if there is a podcast out there that gives you a balanced approach to taxes, we would love to know it. Please let us know in the comments. Yep. Um, we are. This is not financial advice, and we are not accountants or attorneys. Definitely so, not. Yep. And we do not have any accountants or attorneys on our clinical advisory team. And you probably don't have any reason to have a physician or a nurse practitioner on your financial advisory team. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> the next tier, I guess, is the question mark tier. It's um, one of our pet peeves. Uh, it's proprietary blends. 
Yeah, the secret sauce. And you can kind of guess based on the total milligram content of the proprietary blend and then how many ingredients are in there and which ingredient is first and last, whether this is effective or not. General rule of thumb, no, especially if the dose of something that's effective is several thousand milligrams and the proprietary blend is 465 milligrams, almost 100% chance that product is not going to do anything. Yeah, there's one of the energy drinks and maybe our friend Derek did a scientific dismantling of this energy drink, but I believe it had a taurine extremely low on its ingredient list. It had natural flavors higher than taurine <laughs> and uh, an efficacious dose of taurine a lot of times, you know, a thousand milligrams. So, Several grams. Yeah, yeah there, there's probably no way then that it had more than one milligram. So definitely a sub efficacious dose. That's a great example. Um, and then what about different individuals and different health tiers? So we kind of looked at this through the lens of the average person out there who, you know, 70% chance they're overweight. They watch three hours of TV yeah. per day. They're not eating fruits and vegetables. Genetic risk factors. Yeah. What if you have someone with um, severely elevated levels of blood cholesterol, someone with FH who is 20 years old, they just found out they're headed for a heart attack at age 40. Where's the best use of their healthcare dollars? Probably makes sense to go carnivore and avoid lipid lowering therapy at all costs. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I guess if you don't live as long, you don't incur as much expense. Yeah. So that's one way to look at it. <laughs> I guess so. Um, take out a life insurance <laughs> policy before you get um, assessed for health conditions, I guess. Uh, this is not uh, health or life insurance advice, <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, we kind of consider these the nukes to your health and in any health score that could be pretty applicable if you have an apob over certainly over 150 um, or even over 200 that would be some major red flags uh, for um, atherosclerotic burden throughout your entire body not just in your coronaries but uh, addressing that is going to be uh, you know uh, through all means but likely through pharmacologic means is going to be your best intervention. Same thing as an individual with an A1C over 6.5, basically at all costs address that. Um, a CRP over 10. There's a lot of these health nukes that uh, must be addressed before anything else, um, but with everything else in a tier. Yeah, it would just be a matter of prioritization and the hierarchy and probably gonna invest more in getting your lipids under control through medication versus nope. a greens supplement if yeah. you're getting those two branches and where to spend yep. your money. Yeah, um, I used to say, and maybe maybe I still am, I'm the most natural crunchy physician that there is, but if somebody comes and sees me and their initial A1C, at, and it's a true A1C, it's not skewed by red blood cell lifespan. It, let's say it's 9.5. I'm probably not gonna recommend try diet and exercise, come back in four months and see what happens. <laughs> there, I'm probably gonna give them some tools to get out of the choke hold of a quicksand um, that they're in at that point. Um, and it, you know, as it comes to the balance between natural intervention, um, and pharmacologic intervention, I could argue that our entire, uh, society is not natural. We're indoors. We have chemicals all around. You're trying to avoid forever chemicals. You're trying to avoid, uh, phthalates. You're trying to avoid bisphenol A. There's a lot of things that are unnatural. As you age, you could argue that the increase in phosphodiesterase E5 as you age, PDE increases throughout the body is unnatural. So the most natural thing you could do is take a two milligram dose of Tadalafil and bring that down to normal. If you're born with a mutation in, um, you know, your LDL receptor, um, you know, whatever it is. Not one of the good ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, let's say HMGCA reductase is just uh, unnaturally high in your case, then taking a very low dose of something like pravastatin or rosuvastatin could bring you back down to the normal limit. And that could, arguably, that would be the most natural thing to do. So um, keep in mind that in an unnatural environment, uh, natural intervention is not always the first thing, but lifestyle intervention is always um, along with whatever else you do. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And then 
I suppose for someone who is more advanced in their health journey, so let's say someone has their calories in check, they don't have uh, unmanaged chronic conditions, because someone with managed chronic conditions, this could also apply to, uh, basically the advice for that person would be to move down the tier list. So, you know, they've already got their pillars of health, they've already got their diet, nutrition, they're spending time outside. Um, then they can move down to testing to see if there's anything mm -hmm. that they are missing. And again, it depends on how proactive someone wants to be. Nobody has to go get testing for their nutrients or their blood work. Um, but it is a very wise choice if you're at the level where, hey, you know, I'm, I'm metabolically healthy. I want to make sure I stay that way. Then that's the logical path to follow. Yeah. A common question we get is, who is a, a good candidate for your clinic or who's the avatar of a patient for your clinic? And our clinic is... Um, you know, it goes hand in hand with our podcast. It's part of our goal to develop, to deliver high quality evidence-based clinical and scientific information to the public and also to other clinicians and scientists free of cost. And in the case of the clinic, individualized information, not free of cost, but um, regardless of what stage you're in, you can seek expert advice and figure out where to go next. But in many cases, just like if your car is broken down and it has flat tires, the very first step is to fix those flat tires, um, attempt to start um, improving your lifestyle, and, and then go into the Formula One mechanic. I remember having a podcast with a health optimization clinician, and um, we were discussing the difference between preventive medicine and health optimization. And previously, and also I'm going to keep saying this because I think it's true, I like to say, Thank you for being interested in providing preventive medicine and health optimization to the public because the first step of health optimization is preventive medicine. Before you put that turbocharger on your car, you had to fix that flat tire. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really good overview. Uh, hopefully this was somewhat entertaining and organized with our tiers list. We thought it would be fun to do. We, we enjoyed putting the information together um, and if there's anything that we didn't cover that you want a tier classification on, please leave that below in the comments. We'd love to check those things out. As always, um, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening and may God give you health and happiness.